Welcome back to D-Web Decoded, where we explore the latest innovations and key players in the decentralized web. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Cami Russo, who is the founder of The Defiant, and she is the author of The Infinite Machine, which is a great book about the history of Ethereum. And she's also a film producer now. She has a new documentary, uh, which we're going to be talking about on the episode here. Uh, Cami, it's great to see you again. Thanks for being here. Yeah, so great to see you, Aaron. Amazing. So, Cammy, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction here? You've got a pretty rich background, uh, kind of at uh, the intersection of just media, entrepreneurship. Um, you've written a book. You're doing movies now. You're you're doing all sorts of stuff. So, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction so uh, our folks can get to know you better? Okay. Well, doing movies, plural, might be too <laughs> big <laughs> of a statement, but um, anyway. So, my my background is uh, I'm a journalist. I'm currently running the Defiant, which I founded in 2019. The Defiant is what I think and hopefully uh, many people think is the best source of DeFi and Web3 news and information. Um, and uh, previously uh, to the Defiant, uh, I was a market reporter at Bloomberg News. I was at Bloomberg for eight years. Um, my last two years at Bloomberg, I was covering crypto. Um, and, um, yeah, left, uh, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll, you'll hear my dog in the background. That's another, uh, fact about myself. I do have a, a golden doodle named Conga. Um, <laughs> she's now very excited. Um, but yeah, so, um, I've been, uh, markets like fi financial journalists, most of my career, uh, I got excited about crypto in 2013 wh while I was living in Argentina, uh, with Bloomberg, I was covering, you know, all the different ways that Argentines had to protect their savings and investments against inflation and currency controls. And it was in that context that I learned about Bitcoin. Um, I wrote my first Bitcoin story then uh, had a really hard time convincing my editors that it was a real thing that we should cover, um, but it was quickly the most read story. Uh, and that's kind of when uh, the crypto bug bit me and, and I was interested in, in blockchain and crypto ever since. So like I said, I spent my last two years at Bloomberg 2018, 2019. Uh, actually 2017 and 2018 covering uh, crypto um, and uh, I left to finish writing The Infinite Machine uh, which is uh, a book on the history of Ethereum it's right there uh, behind me um, and uh, yeah I thought about you know writing this book as I was covering the crypto boom of 2017 because I saw that there were many books about Bitcoin, but nothing written about Ethereum. And Ethereum at the time, you know, was what was fueling all this hype around ICOs and tokens. And I just thought, you know, it, it was such an interesting backstory uh, to it. And um, yeah, that's why I, I went out and wrote the book. Um, and I also wanted to spend more time covering crypto, which Bloomberg at the time wasn't prepared to do. Like I, I pitched them, um, to, to create a crypto dedicated team, um, but they didn't go for it uh, at the time. So for you know all those reasons, I, I left and finished my book and then started The Defiant, which was just supposed to be uh, a newsletter that would be like a, a side uh, project to freelancing, but then it became my main job and it grew from a newsletter to a media company where we have um, a 12 person team, a podcast, a daily news stories that go on our website, a YouTube channel, and um, and two uh, two newsletters now. So so yeah, that's that's my my story. <laughs> wow, very impressive. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a lot that you've managed to pack into uh, eight years uh, or a ten year time frame there. So very impressive and very good book by the way i would recommend it to folks who want to learn a bit more about the i think you were your your book was the first one that came out on the history of ethereum if i recall yep. correctly there was that's right like, for a couple of years we had like a slew of these ethereum history books coming out but i mm -hmm. think yours was actually the first um yes. so it's so very nice it was I definitely recommend reading that for folks who haven't checked that out um so yeah, so obviously at the Defiant, you all are producing content across lots of different verticals, across uh, like newsletters, YouTube, podcasts. You have a, a, a proper website where you're producing articles and things. 
and then now you're moving into uh, films. So I understand you have a like a new feature film coming out about uh, that is based on on your book, and um, hoping you could tell us a bit about that project. Yeah. Um, uh, also, to be clear, this is not something that's being done by the Defiant. This is you know I'm selling the movie rights to my book to a production company. Um, so right. So the Infinite Machine. Um, is like I said, a book on the history of Ethereum. It's told in a very narrative way, like it's meant to read like a fiction book. So, you know, there's dialogue, there's description, it's told like a novel. That, that was kind of my, my goal when, when writing the book, that it just read like, a, like an entertaining story, um, very much kind of inspired by the Michael Lewis style of writing nonfiction. Um, and so, uh, you know, luckily, some people thought it was a good, um, you know, foundation for a movie, and so I've been negotiating the the rights to um, to the to the like the movie rights to my book uh, with um, Scott Free, which is Ridley Scott's production company, and so we've you know been in, in that process. It, it's a bit complicated. Uh, I initially sold the option of the movie to um, Versus Entertainment, which is a Spain-based production company. They brought in Scott Free to co-produce. Um, but now I'm, you know, in, in the process of negotiating the, the, the movie rights directly with Scott Free. So that's delayed the actual production of the movie a little bit. Uh, but in any case, the plan is to have a major, you know, a feature film, a, based on my book and the idea is you know like uh think of like the um, the social network the movie about facebook but for ethereum and crypto so you know a very hopefully you know hollywood mainstream style movie with actors and you know uh, uh, like an exciting plot um that's based on the ethereum story that's that's kind of the the plan with the whole thing very cool very cool and I have some questions about the, the film itself or, and how you're going to be producing it. But uh, my immediate question is, what's the, the process like for, for negotiating the, the, the rights to, to producing this? That, that seems kind of complicated. <laughs> how, how does that work? <laughs> well, first, uh, the, like, a production company will buy the option to buy my, the rights to the movie. So when they write... When, when they buy the option to buy the rights, they have a time period, usually 18 months to two years, where they develop, um, you know, they, they develop the in initial uh, phases of production of the film. They do things like see whether there's appetite for distribution, um, uh, start writing a script, um, and, and kind of gauge whether the movie is actually you know, feasible or will be a good project. So they, the production company will, will, will buy the option. And in that time, I can't obviously sell my rights to anyone else. And it, it's kind of, they, they bought the option. So they're kind of in the process of deciding whether they'll buy the rights um, at, at the end of the, the op when the option period expires. So when that happens, they can either say, I actually want to go ahead and, um, and make this movie or uh, no, like I, I, I'm not going to buy your rights from you. Um, and uh, when they, yeah, they, they, they actually, you know, buy when, when they buy the, the rights, then, um, then kind of the production phase of the movie starts in, in earnest. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I'm just like starting to learn about this, but definitely not an expert, but I mean, it's all based on a great script. Um, and uh, I found out that the, like when the movie is based on a book, the book author doesn't have a, any say on, you know, the movie script, which is maybe why, you know, so, mm. ma so many people think that, you know, the book is always better than the movie. <laughs> um, so yeah. I don't know, but uh, hopefully, you know, I'm a, a producer of the movie, which is not always the case. Like uh, book authors aren't always involved directly in the uh, production side. That doesn't really give me like a legal uh, say 
in how the movie gets made, but you know, I'm hoping to have a bit of like a, an in to the production side of things, like the the, the script writing uh, side of things. Um, so yeah, it's uh, they once the script is made, then the casting director will go and like send the script to like different. Um, uh, actors and actresses and then they get the, the initial um, like main cast members together and with that they have like a, a, a package they can sell to um, you know major uh, movie studios and distribution companies like I don't know like will it be on, on Netflix or Apple TV like will uh, Paramount do this or like I don't know. They, they'll they'll get th- those pieces in place, um, and with all of that in place, then it's actually you know time for like shooting the movie and you know making the thing. Um, so very very long complex process in, in, involves many you know different sides of it. Uh, so we'll see. I don't know. I, it's um, I'm getting a glimpse into this weird world for the first time so yeah very excited to see how it it pans out yeah so the filmmaking process is this is quite complex right just just even this is this is even before we actually get to the the actual making of the film this is uh, everything Mm -hmm. is the pre-production and just the negotiation of the rights and then they have to cast and find actors and all the who do you think is going to play like uh the metallic booterin like in this uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or like Charles Oof. Hoskins said, or these people. like you have, I you don't have, know. Who, well, it's interesting because you have so many larger than life people that you have to find. Yeah. Uh, like with the Social Network, you know, you, it was just you, one. you used that analogy earlier. Or, it's like well, you have Mark Zuckerberg and you have the Winklevoss twins and the Winklevoss. Yeah, yeah. So you have to but find. But now, the yeah, guy, there's like, like eight, like or seven different Ethereum co-founders. <laughs> so it's like yeah, a and big all these cast. guys have like massive egos and like mm-hmm. you know they're kind of like these larger than life people or whatever. Like how are no, you? Gonna, nobody's gonna yeah. like the, the 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 actor that's playing them for sure. Like I'm gonna have Joe Lubin <laughs> 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 complaining. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, who do you that, think that should play like quite, that, that might be the hardest. That might be the hardest part of this whole process, honestly. <laughs> um, but um, well, anyway. I mean, I know you guys at the Defiant have been doing a lot more work with uh, kind of longer form video content as well, mm-hmm. uh, just things on YouTube and and trying to do um, you know different types of of content documenting the industry and things of that nature. Maybe maybe give us uh, a bit more color into how that uh, how that experiment is going and, and what you guys have found uh, or what your what your you know your readers and your listeners and watchers have found valuable. Um. Yeah, I mean, at, at the Defiant on our YouTube channel, we've always done uh, longer form um, documentary style uh, videos from the start. Like that's been our way of differentiating from um, just like the talking heads on uh, crypto YouTubes, uh, YouTubers, which uh, you know they're they're fine, but I think there, there's like um, a narrative aspect that's uh, that's missing from um from like video production or like crypto focused uh, video production so that's what we're trying to bring to the table uh, we've done a, a few of these like mini mini documentaries uh we we did a really in my opinion really good uh, nft uh, film it's called like the greatest nft film ever made a very ambitious <laughs> title um so i uh, would encourage everyone to go and check it out uh we did a mini doc on uh, tornado cash um and just recently uh just today we published uh the uh our, our latest one which is it was based on um uh, the different narratives and people at East Denver, but the the bigger picture that we're trying to tell is, um, you know, who who's who are the community members shaping Web three, and what's inspiring them. So it's uh, it's called the the Giga Brains of Web three, and we have you know some amazing um, interviewees there, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, I think it's it's um, in in a few minutes you get a, a really good sense of what uh, what narratives narratives are driving the space right now. So yeah, also would encourage everyone to check that out. Very cool, very cool. And I know you interviewed uh, Clara Chow, who's uh, one of the founding officers at Filecoin Foundation for for that, or she was featured in that film as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just wondering if maybe you could talk a bit about. Uh, 
you know, the role that you see, uh, like decentralized storage and data networks, uh, similar to Filecoin, uh, maybe playing in this kind of evolution of, of Web3, or at least to the extent that you, you know, maybe talked about these types of things in your, uh, in the video. Yeah. So I think decentralized storage, it, is a, a key part of Web3 um, and just the next evolution of the web. I think the internet should be decentralized from the ground up. Um, it's how we, uh, we break away from these outdated models that we're subject to. So um, as, you know, as more of our online lives happen on uh, on, on protocols, on decentralized networks, it just makes sense that the, the data that's being produced on those networks is stored in a decentralized way and not in, you know, Amazon uh, servers. Uh, because then, you know, what's the point of, of um, dealing with and like creating content and transacting in decentralized applications if all of that information and data is going to end up in, you know, in, in centralized, in the same centralized companies that are ruling Web2 anyways. So I think, you know, uh, decentralized storage uh, systems like, like Filecoin's IPFS um, are, will be key in actually in meaningfully uh, decentralizing Web3. How do you see just this, this, yeah, in the context of a, of a media business, how do you see uh, perhaps like decentralized uh, data storage and retrieval content delivery mechanisms, maybe, um, you know, changing the future of how like media businesses are run uh, eventually? Obviously, we're, we're kind of a few years away from any of this really being, you know, fully like shovel ready competitive with a YouTube or existing existing uh, platforms. But um, as a media business owner and founder, I mean, how, how does, how, what's your reaction to that? Yeah. So I think right now, um, it, it, using decentralized storage makes sense for, uh, media organizations that are, you know, that are in, in danger of being censored. So, it, and that's a very real threat in many places in the world. Um, so when in places where there's less press freedom, uh, I think it, it's a great alternative for media organizations who, you know, will be publishing um, important uh, information, important uh, reports or, or research to uh, store those articles uh, and store that content on chain to make sure that um, whatever happens, it's it, it, it's not lost. So so that's kind of the a, a real um, value uh, and, and use case that that I see decentralized storage uh, fulfilling today. Um, I think uh, you know with the 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 interface and the application layer that we have right now it, it'll be hard for 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 media companies outside of the ones you know that like i said are being uh, have that this threat of of censorship that i said to uh fully move to uh to you know decentralized media because i i don't think we're there yet um you know i, th I think the just like the experience and distribution uh, can't compete right now with the web two, but um i think especially uh, from you know web three and crypto focus news sites it's definitely in our ethos and in you know what we we want for for the future of, of media to uh, go in this direction so um it, it's why you know i'm so interested in in doing these experiments and um and integrating uh, web3 uh, pieces as much as i can uh on on uh, the defiant uh, but in the end you know it, it is a business like we do need distribution we do need kind of efficient and cheap uh, processes like uh, we're at a 12 person team I only have one developer so that's why I was saying asking about like the interface like it just you know it needs to be easy for an, a regular editor to upload stuff um, and not need any additional uh, technical skills so you know I think 
we're still uh, missing that that kind of um, that UX and distribution side of things. But you know, it's it's early, and I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah, and another area uh, that I find interesting, even as I've been messing around more with with you know uploading my own things to YouTube and 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 things of that nature, just kind of producing some of my own content, and you know, just, or you realize like how, or as we're doing just more video content generally as media companies and as you know human beings and, and and societies and whatever, you realize just like how massive these like just to upload like an hour long video to YouTube is is like a massive amount of data, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and you know, where can you, and, and most people can't really, most people that are doing YouTube content, for instance, like they just upload it and then they delete it from their local device. Because if you have two to three, you know, hour long videos sitting on your laptop, like that's like you're out of memory, basically. That's like your mm-hmm. entire, uh, your entire, you know, so it's your entire storage capacity on your, on your local device. So, uh, so YouTube is kind of serving as this sort of long, you know, just de facto, just storage repository for, for videos right now for video content. But like, as you were alluding to, like, Crypto companies are being, you know, crypto channels on YouTube have been, you know, kicked off or deplatformed or demonetized or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, it's not just crypto; other people have as well. And it, it, you know, it could be like a, you know, it could be like a censorship thing. It could just be like, oh, the platform just doesn't work anymore, and you know, mm-hmm. we can't access it on this given day when we need to. And and th- there aren't really like a whole lot of other, aside from, aside from just maintaining like a pile of hard drives in your closet right? Like where you keep all this stuff, there's not really like a great alternative for storing these things, um, you know, outside of just relying on YouTube and Google to do it for you. Right. Um, and people say like, Oh, well it's free, but it's like, yeah, we all know that like, if it's free, that means like you're the product basically. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe even thinking about it from that way in terms of, you know, how much, you know, how much like content are we maybe losing, just based on the fact that we don't really have, um, you know, effective ways to store it. And if, and if these decentralized distributed storage networks like a Filecoin can get to a point where we do offer a, a cost competitive solution for, uh, we'll call it archival storage, perhaps. I mean, we are, this is already one of the main use cases uh, on the network is, is, is large data sets that are, are, are kind of archival in nature. We don't need to necessarily access them every day, but maybe once every six months or, you know, Maybe, maybe never, but I just want to actually know it, that it still exists. Um, this is a use case that's going to become more and more important because, I mean, it seems it seems unlikely that the Googles and the Microsofts and the AWSs of the world are going to be, uh, you know, producing enough data centers over the coming years to accommodate all the data that's being generated when you factor in all the video content and all the AI, uh, you know, all the AI compute requirements and everything like that. Um, anyway, so we'd love your reaction to that as uh, from the, from the, the media business owner perspective. Yeah, I think, you know, l- like I said, uh, I, th- I think this, this is a really important use case, um, to be able to, you know, uh, have this assurance that your content, uh, is, is not going to be, uh, removed or, or that your account is not going to be, uh, removed or, or censored, um, I think the yeah the, the challenge is to do it in a cost effective way and in, in a way that um, that it makes sense for um, for views and distribution because if if you know if, if like I'm storing a video that that can't be accessed um, um, that you know doesn't work well for a media company like even even if it's a documentary that we published three years ago I still want to you know, get views from that. Like, like the NFT film that I mentioned, we did that three years ago and it's still getting views. Um, so it's like all that evergreen content that media companies produce, like especially long form content often is evergreen. Like you're, it's, it's stuff that you put a lot of work into and you want people to find years from now. Um, so it's, it, you know, I think the tech needs to be at a place as well where, you know, you, you can store this, but that, you know, that, viewers and, and your audience can easily retrieve it as well. Awesome. And then uh, maybe just more generally, uh, we're here in May 2024 right now. What are you excited about over the next, uh, you know, next like eight months toward the end of the year? Like what, what are you uh, most interested in, in in the crypto web three space? Any any trends you're particularly keen to or following particularly closely? 
Um, uh, well, yeah, uh, tons of things. I think there's, there's so much um, going on, uh, a few things. One um, is Socialify. I, it's been really interesting to see this new um, the vertical blow up recently with Forecaster and, and Frentech and Lens. Uh, it's great to see non-strictly financial use cases in Web3 get, get some uh, sort of traction, although still, you know, very niche, but uh, really interesting to see what social media looks like with a uh, crypto uh, component. Um, interested to see uh, where the staking and restaking, um, uh, you know, ecosystem goes. Uh, this is, you know, maybe a, a little bit uh, in the weeds, but, you know, Eigenlayer has just um, created this entirely new uh, ecosystem within Ethereum and, and DeFi. Um, and they've, you know, they'll be going, they'll be launching their mainnet. So I'll, I'll be looking to see whether the, you know, multiple billion dollars that have been staked in, in that protocol, um, if, if, you know, if it lives up to the, the enormous hype uh, around it. Um, so that's something I'm watching. Um, I think um, there's been also a, a lot of developments in like the token distribution space. So like points, airdrops, um, and teams have been innovating on uh, different ways to Im improve this um, with, you know, uh, working on uh, civil resistance and, and different kind of distribution models. So I think, you know, that that's something that... Uh, I, I, I'm I'm watching as well. All right, great, great. Well, thank you so much, Cami, for coming on the show to share your thoughts and to and to undertake in this experiment uh, with uh, decentralized video file storage with us. Uh, really appreciate your time. I'll I'll turn the floor back to you for any final thoughts and uh, how can folks find you or learn more about what you all are working on over at the Defiant. Um, no, thanks so much for having me. Uh, Love being part of this experiment. Looking forward to uploading uh, more of our content uh, to Filecoin and IPFS. Um, and yeah, just the defiant.io and you'll be able to subscribe to our newsletters um, and find links to uh, all of our different channels there. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Cami. And uh, we will be back with another great guest very soon.